What is life? Well, that may seem a very strange question to ask. And for most of us, it may seem that the answer is obvious. If you look around you at the sorts of things that you're familiar with on a day-to-day -day basis, like some of these creatures shown in this slide, it seems obvious when something is alive. But it turns out that the answer to this question is not quite as obvious as it seems. We might wonder, why would we even want to ask that question? Why would it, have be, why would it be a concern to astrobiologists to ask the question, what is life? Well, if we're looking for life elsewhere, for example, on another planet, we need to be able to say what life is. What is it that we're actually looking for? And to do that, we need some sort of definition of life. If we're trying to understand the origin of life on the Earth, we need to know what we're talking about. What are we actually looking for in the rocks? What sort of evidence in the early fossil record, for example, of life on Earth are we looking for? And when is something living and when is something not? So astrobiologists are searching for life in the universe, but before they do that, they need to know what is life, and they need to be able to tell people what it is that they're looking for. And that's why this question is so important. It also turns out, of course, the question, what is life, has huge social implications. For example, in in vitro fertilization. You've seen all sorts of arguments on the media about when is a human embryo alive? Well, we're not going to discuss those questions in this course, but the question, what is life, and when does something become alive, has social implications as well as implications for astrobiology. So let's have a look at some of the characteristics that you and I might think define living things. Well, if you look at pet dogs, for instance, they seem to be very complex and they exhibit complex behaviours. We might look at that behaviour, we might look at the behaviour of our pet dog, the way it greets us, and we might say, well, that sort of complexity is indicative of life. Non-life doesn't exhibit the same sort of complexity as life does. It also seems to grow. Again, if you've ever had a pet dog, it seems fairly obvious that it starts off as a puppy and it grows to an adult dog. And if you look around at most of life on Earth, it seems to grow. This seems to be a characteristic of living things. And you might think, well, that's a characteristic of life. And we might list that as another type of feature that we associate with living things. Life also replicates. That may be fairly obvious. If it didn't, it wouldn't persist for very long. And again, you can see this with dogs. They replicate, they produce puppies. And this seems to be a characteristic of all life on Earth that many people are familiar with. Replication seems to be necessary for life to persist on a planet for many generations. Life also metabolizes. That means, in very simple terms, it eats. It needs a source of energy in order to be able to grow and reproduce and do some of the other characteristics that we've just talked about. So we might say that one characteristic of life is that it metabolizes, it eats food, it makes energy. Life also has a system for storing information. In the case of life on Earth, this is the double helix of DNA. And that information storage system is necessary to pass on information from one generation to another, but also to be able to program the cells in our bodies that allow them to grow and carry out the functions that they need to do to be life in the first place. And life also seems to evolve by Darwinian evolution. Early dogs, for instance, probably look something like this wolf. And today, of course, dogs look very, very different. It's not just a process of natural selection. In the case of um, dogs, they have been artificially selected by human beings, artificially selected for particular characteristics. But nevertheless, this is a type of selection, and it illustrates very well the process of evolution by which organisms can evolve and change, and in the natural environment, evolve and change to cope with changes in their environment, alterations in the natural habitats in which they live. The ability to adapt to change, to evolve in a Darwinian sense, also seems to be a characteristic of life. And indeed, this ability to evolve has even been used as a definition of life. Here is a definition by Gerald Joyce, a NASA scientist, who described life as a self-sustaining chemical system capable of undergoing Darwinian evolution. Just one example of a type of written definition, a simple definition of all life on the Earth that we might apply to life on other planetary bodies. But hang on a second. We need to be very careful 
because many of the characteristics that I've just described for life are things we also find in the non-biological world. This is a picture of a tornado, and as you can see, it seems to, it seems to exhibit some quite complex behaviours. It forms these twisting funnels of air. Would we say that because it's complex and it exhibits complex behaviours, it is alive? Well, I think most of us would agree that a tornado is not alive. Many things in the non-biological world also grow. These salt crystals, just a few millimetres in size, can grow into these large handheld crystals that you can see here. And yet this crystal is not alive, despite the fact that it seems to be growing. Replication seems to be a much more robust characteristic of life, and yet other things replicate that we don't think of being alive. Computer programs, for example, can replicate from one computer to another. Indeed, when you put a file on a memory stick and you share it with your friends, you're replicating a file from one computer to another, but you wouldn't say that that memory stick is alive in any way, and yet the information on it is being replicated. And even non-living things seem to metabolize in a very broad way. This fire, for example, is burning up trees. And as it's burning trees, it's releasing energy. In fact, in the same chemical reaction that occurs in our own bodies, as we burn up organic carbon in our food with oxygen, we make energy. This is called aerobic respiration. In a forest fire, the trees are being burnt in oxygen and making energy. The chemical reaction is exactly the same. It's just a little bit less controlled than the chemical reaction inside our own bodies. But in a very broad way, we could say that this forest fire is metabolizing. And yet, most of us probably wouldn't say that a forest fire is alive. There are other complications as well. For example, many things that look biological seem to lack characteristics that we expect from life. For example, viruses cannot replicate on their own. They need a host cell in order to divide. Does that mean that viruses are not alive? Well, some people think that that's the case, that you cannot include viruses in a definition of life. Other people think it's absurd that something like a virus that has such a profound impact on our bodies cannot be considered alive, particularly when it contains nucleic acids such as DNA. And many other living things cannot replicate on their own. Here is a rather strange example. A rabbit cannot replicate on its own. It needs another rabbit. Does that mean that a rabbit on its own is not life? And only when it's with another rabbit with which it can replicate does it become life? Well, I think all of us would consider that to be rather an absurd question. I think most people would consider their pet rabbit, even when it's on its own, to be alive. But this shows you some of the complications that we get into when we try to define life using particular characteristics. Evolution seems to be a very robust way to define life, and we've seen that there's even a definition of life based on the ability of organisms to undergo Darwinian evolution. But in recent years, we've seen computer programs developed that seem to be able to evolve and change over time. Would we say these computer programs are alive? Well, maybe at some point in the future, when computers become much more complex, there might be an argument worth having on whether computers are alive or not. But these early programs that seem to evolve and change inside a computer, we would not say are really truly alive. So even the characteristic of evolution may not necessarily be a defining characteristic of life. And this brings us to a possibility, a problem with the definition of life. The possibility is that life is just a definition, a human definition. There is no really physical or chemical characteristic about life that we can use to define what it is. It's just a human definition that's useful to us. And this is what philosophers refer to as a non-natural kind. Some things in the world are referred to as natural kinds. For example, the element gold is a natural kind. And what this means is it has a very distinct definition. We can define its density. We can define its atomic weight. We can define its melting point, and so on and so forth. If someone says to you, what is gold, you can tell that person exactly what it is. And you can list the physical properties of that element that define gold. And we call such a material a natural kind. A non-natural kind 
is an object that is defined by human definition. And a good example of this is a chair. We might define a chair as an object that you sit on. And then what happens if someone sits on a table? Does that mean that a table is also a chair? And so on and so forth. And you can see how we can get into all sorts of circular arguments defining what is a chair, what is a table, and what is the difference between these objects. This is an example of a non-natural kind, and ultimately it doesn't matter what you define as a chair or a table. It's just a human definition, and you can define it however you like, as long as you're consistent and other people understand the definition you're using. Maybe life is the same. Maybe life is just a word. It defines part of chemistry that we like to think of as encapsulating our ideas of life. And we can draw that line of life and non-life wherever we want, as long as we all agree what we're talking about, and that definition is agreed amongst scientists. It doesn't really matter where you define the line. It's really just an empty human definition, but nevertheless a definition that's important for astrobiology. So we should consider the possibility that there is no sharp definition of life. It's a human definition useful to us. Let's have a look at some of the history of attempts to understand the nature of life and what is life and how we might define it. Well, unsurprisingly, like a lot of things, the ancient Greeks gave thought to the definition of life and what constitutes life. Their school of thinking is sometimes called materialism. And they had an idea that life has a soul and the soul is made of atoms of fire. And this follows on from the thoughts of Empedocles, one of the early Greek philosophers, who asserted that all things are made of earth, water, fire, and air. And because life seems very lively, it's made up of atoms of fire. And these early thoughts about the definition of life show us something very important. Right from the beginning of very early definitions, people thought there's something very special about life, something that separates it from the non-living. For the Greeks, it was having a soul and being made of a particular type of atomic material. As time developed and people's thoughts developed, we move into the European Enlightenment. And during the Enlightenment, scientists had a similar sort of idea to the ancient Greeks. It's called vitalism, the idea that life contains some vital force. And that when this vital force is added into something non-biological, it becomes biological. It's the same sort of idea, the idea that life has some special type of characteristic that makes it categorically different from non-living. And this led to all sorts of ideas around the idea of spontaneous generation. Spontaneous generation is the concept that when a vital force is added to non-living matter, it can become living. So meat, for example, when it gains this vital force, turns into maggots. And sawdust and wheat, when it gains some vital force, it turns into mice. And these were some of the ideas that, that dominated thinking about the origin and nature of life in the early years of the 17th century. Early thinkers in the Enlightenment even came up with some very, very bizarre experiments. And to you and I, these experiments seem utterly ridiculous, but they were taken quite seriously in the early stages of scientific study. This is an experiment, an example of a documented experiment from the 17th century. And the idea is that you take a jar and you put into that jar some wheat husks and some old underwear and you seal the jar and you leave it for 21 days. And during those 21 days, a vital force will move into the jar and it will transform the underwear and the wheat husks into mice. And when you open that jar 21 days later, you will find mice. Now, you really have to question the powers of observation of those early scientists that added wheat husks into a jar and didn't recognize that there were baby mice in there. But do remember, this was the very early years of the Enlightenment when the scientific method was not fully developed and people didn't understand the idea of controlled experiments. These were the sorts of things that people wrote down and very rapidly became folklore and accepted knowledge. The knowledge that vital forces could transform non-living into living matter. There were many attempts to disprove spontaneous generation. Let's just look at two of them. They're rather interesting because they show how the scientific method began to develop and with it more definitive ideas about the possible nature of life. 
This is a rather ingenious experiment that was developed by Francesco Redi, an Italian doctor. And he had a hunch that maggots might not be produced by spontaneous generation, but might have something to do with flies buzzing around meat. So he did this experiment where he put pieces of meat on the surface of a slab, and in two of the experiments he covered them. In one of the experiments he covered it with a metal lid, which prevented anything from getting in or out and landing on the surface of the meat. In another experiment, he had a piece of meat on a slab and he covered it with gauze. The gauze would allow through a vital force if it really did exist, but it would stop flies from getting to the meat. And in the final experiment, he just left meat out in the open so that it could exchange anything with the outside world. And what did he observe? Well, unsurprisingly, a few days later, what he observed was that on the meat that was completely covered in the metal lid, there were no maggots. In the meat covered in gauze, there were also no maggots. But in the meat that was left open, there were maggots. And the interpretation of this experiment is that flies were required to somehow interact with the meat, lay their eggs, as it turns out, and form maggots. But in the case where the meat was covered in the gauze, if there was a vital force out there that took hold of the meat and turned it into maggots, we would expect that meat to have also given rise to maggots. But it didn't. And this was one experiment that brought to an end the idea of spontaneous generation and uh, created a more empirical basis for understanding the nature of life. This is the second experiment and possibly the most elegant experiment that finally brought an end to the idea of spontaneous generation. It's an experiment that was designed by famous microbiologist Louis Pasteur. In 1859 he won a prize from the French Academy of Sciences who had challenged scientists to come up with an experiment would end the idea of spontaneous generation. He developed these swan neck flasks in which he put broth. And in one of these flasks, he boiled the broth to kill off all the life. And this swan neck that you can see on the flask prevented any type of microbes or other life from getting into the flask. And once he had boiled the broth and he left these flasks for many days, nothing happened to it. It remained completely as it had been after he boiled it. But in one of the flasks, he broke off the swan neck, and so opening up the flask to the outside world. And unsurprisingly, after a few days, this broth became turbid. Microorganisms, as it turned out, had landed in the flask, were growing in the broth, and had caused it to be filled with life. And this was another experiment that showed that if you take broth, it doesn't just spontaneously give rise to life. It has to be accessed, it has to have microbes land in the broth and be able to grow within it. And this experiment was one of the most elegant experiments that showed that microorganisms were also responsible for causing life to emerge in different materials and that it had to move around and be able to access the material in order to create life. And this was the first experiment that really ended spontaneous generation. So we have this history and we've got these ideas about the definition of life. Where are we today? Well, most astrobiologists today, I think, accept the idea that life might just be a working definition. And whatever types of definitions we do take for life, we can probably find exceptions to the rule. But most astrobiologists also accept that we can use working definitions to define life. They're useful. We can use them to search for life on other planets as long as we all agree on what those basic ideas about life might be and what some of the characteristics are of life that we're looking for on other planets. So long as we keep an open mind when we're searching for it elsewhere, maybe there is something that's completely different, life as we don't know it. So as scientists, when we explore other planets, we keep an open mind to the possibility of types of alien life that may not fit our definition of life. But these definitions that we do have allow us to search for life elsewhere and allows us to study the structure of most of the life that we're familiar with in a consistent and rational way. So what have we learned? We've learned that attempts to define life have been made since the ancients. And that in fact it's very difficult to define life accurately. It may even be impossible to define life accurately if it's just a human definition. But despite that, we can develop working definitions of life that are useful in astrobiology, and we can use those definitions to define what it is that we're searching for on other planets.
But we need to be cautious and we need to have an open mind as scientists for the possibility that there might be types of life that don't quite fit our own definition of life.